Hello, Highline. My name is Fuzi Bilal. I am the Associate Director of Outreach Services. I'm here to introduce our uh, guest today. Um, we're we're uh, happy to have uh, Imam Dr. Yasser Qadi with us today. He is a uh, well-known scholar in the Muslim community. Uh, he served as a Dean of Academic Affairs at the Al-Maghrib Institute in Houston, Texas. He's also a former He's also a former um, faculty and professor uh, for several colleges. Dr. Yesser is a resident scholar at, El, uh, at East Plano Islamic Center. Uh, if I'm correct, he, he will be addressing the impact of war on society, highlighting Islamophobia and stereotypes of violence. Welcome, Dr. Yesser. We're happy to have you. Thank you for being here. Uh, welcome for having me. I'm very honored. And uh, it's East Plano, not Planto, but that's okay. <laughs> So should I begin? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so uh, first and foremost, um, uh, may uh, the peace and blessings of uh, God Almighty be upon uh, all of those who are uh, uh, following the guidance. And I ask God to bless us on this auspicious day. This is a happy day, uh, an inauguration day. And I'm actually surprised that uh, so many of you are attending um, uh, this talk rather than watching what's going on uh, in DC. But um, uh, nonetheless, uh, I hope and pray that uh, this talk will be of some uh, benefit. It is an auspicious day for all of us. Um, I think we can all um, um, breathe a sigh of relief. I think I speak on behalf of almost everybody really that's going to be attending today that um, um, we're back to the normalcy of our standard problems with our current administration, uh, having seen four years of very... Uh, interesting, very uh, erratic, uh, and very unpredictable um, reality. So let's hope that the next uh, four years, and especially the pandemic, um, are, are uh, quelled given the current administration. So today's talk is actually pretty, um, uh, pretty deep. It's pretty uh, relevant to MLK because uh, Martin Luther King famously remarked in one of the last speeches that he ever gave uh, that uh, he said, and I quote, that we now see that the evils of racism and economic exploitation and militarism are all tied together. He mentioned three evils, racism, economic exploitation, and militarism are all tied together. And he then went on and he said, the evils of capitalism are as real as the evils of militarism and the evils of racism. You cannot really get rid of one without getting rid of the others. The whole structure of American life must be changed America, according to MLK, is a hypocritical nation and we must put our own house in order. End quote. Harsh words. Some would say damning words. These are the words of somebody that uh, obviously uh, is speaking from a very different uh, socioeconomic paradigm than the majority of, or I should say, a very large group of people of this country. And it's something for us to think about. 50 years have gone by since he said that. And today's brief talk, I'm going to contrast and compare much of what he said with uh, sentiments from within my own faith tradition, which is the Islamic uh, faith tradition, because obviously I'm speaking to you uh, not just uh, as a professor, but as a, as a Muslim cleric, as an American Muslim cleric, who is very concerned with the realities of our nations and with really the exact same problems that that uh, plagued this country for the last few centuries and which were so eloquently expressed by MLK. It is truly saddening to note that the sentiments that MLK expressed are just as relevant 50 years later as they were when he expressed them. Nothing has changed. If anything, if anything, in many ways, the problem has actually become uh, exacerbated. So here we are today, uh, taking a look back at the, especially the last four, but I would say really the last, you know, 15, 20 years, really, uh, you know, since especially the attack, uh, the horrific attacks of 9-11, and to see the realities of what MLK said in light of uh, what has happened in our own generations and lifetimes. So the three uh, um, milit the, the three evils that he expressed, uh, racism, and then uh, economic disparity and capitalism, and then militarism. Let's summarize uh, from our perspective, and especially the American Muslim perspective, uh, what we can analyze with regards to the American situation and scenario. Let's begin with racism. And of course, racism is the one thing that uh, obviously uh, troubled uh, Martin Luther King and many of us uh, for most of his life and for most of our lives. The concept of racism, the notion of subjugation of one race uh, over another, uh, the notion of privileging one 
entity or one groups of people over others is something that goes back uh, to the very beginnings of recorded human history. In fact, we do not know of any era, we do not know uh, of any civilization that freed itself completely from the evils of racism. As early as we have recorded history, and as early as we can go back even to the greatest of the philosophers, we find racism is embedded through their entire thought. Aristotle, for example, claimed that the Greek race should be free by nature, but other races, and he means here, of course, you know, uh, uh, those of a darker complexion, uh, were born to be slaves. This is the great Aristotle. No doubt he's a genius in some matters and affairs, and yet here he is pontificating to us and telling us that Greeks are by nature free, and other races are born to be slaves. In fact, ancient Greeks viewed themselves as being inherently by birth uh, superior to all others and everybody else was simply called barbarian in other words the term barbarian was literally applied to every single other race other than their own it wasn't one race that they called you were either uh, a part of their race or you were a barbarian that was the term that was given uh, to uh, every other race tradition and uh, the romans of course uh, were just as guilty of this. The Emperor Julian, he claimed that it was self-evident that Romans were more humane and more civilized than all other nations. In other words, the emperor is claiming you don't even need to prove this. It's obvious to anybody who examines uh, you know, the world that we are better, that we are more humane, that we are more civilized. And then he uh, remarked that the, uh, the Syrians are well known to be hot tempered. The Egyptians you know, are well known to be of this nature. And he kept on you know, listing various other races, the broad stereotypes of the generalizations. And of course, again, that type of attitude, uh, even though it goes back 2000 years, it is still endemic uh, amongst many, many people of our times. Uh, the irony, of course, is that, you know, some, not all, but some uh, uh, of those who converted to the early faith of Christianity, uh, they also adopted, you know, this, uh, this type of, of, of notion. And uh, for some segments of uh, th that uh, civilization, the Christian civilization, it was also understood that uh, their race and their peoples were better than others. And in fact, uh, Pope Paul III in 1537, Pope Paul proclaimed that the inhabitants of the southern continents, uh, meaning here, of course, uh, Africa, uh, and basically everybody, you know, south of the Mediterranean, uh, the inhabitants of the southern continents, he issued a papal decree, by the way, and this papal decree, it legitimized the trade of uh, um, uh, slavery. Of course, the institution of slavery, of course, um, uh, predates the, the, the papal decree, but the papal decree gave it the, the stamp of basically godly approval. So the papal decree of 1537, uh, in which uh, Pope Paul III proclaimed, and I quote, that the inhabitants of the southern continents should be treated like irrational animals, and they may be used exclusively for our profit, end quote. In other words, he uh, justified uh, the enslavement of peoples of different races and different skin colors. And he said that that's basically God's given right. We are God's chosen people and they are, you know, barbarians or they're irrational animals. And it is completely legit for us to do what we are doing. And uh, we are well aware that some of the greatest, you know, philosophers of even post-Reformation Europe, even post-Reformation Europe were out and out through and through racist. David Hume, considered to be one of the greatest of the uh, Enlightenment philosophers, 1776, a, a person whom uh, many of the founding fathers admired immensely. They read his works. In fact, it is even said some of them studied or met with him, right? David Hume, uh, you know, the Scottish philosopher, he writes in one of his treatises that, and I quote, blacks are inherently inferior to whites. This is David Hume. You know, Edmund Burke, I mean, 1797, again, considered to be of the greatest uh, uh, political philosophers and somebody whose political philosophy directly impacted our constitution. It is, it is um, correct to point out that, you know, much of our uh, constitution and much of our uh, division of powers, it goes back to specific figures. Uh, uh, Edmund Burke is one of them. Uh, Edmund Burke, uh, uh, also is was a through and through racist in his writings very clearly privileging uh europeans not just whites by the way europeans like a race for example not just the skin color uh perhaps one of the worst of them was uh, emmanuel kant and kant again i mean you cannot deny that 
Kant has some really intriguing, very, very deep uh, philosophical notions. I mean, uh, and again, I'm not taking away from the fact that he has some original contributions, obviously, to philosophy. And yet, unbelievably, or maybe not so unbelievably, here he is writing that, you know, blacks are naturally defective. Uh, and they are a race that, and he and I quote, have not made any profound and well-known impact in Western history, right? They've not made any impact. Like they're basically a race that has no <coughs> impact in humanity, right? And so uh, you have somebody, excuse me, you know, as profound as Kant, still through and through a complete racist. So it's not surprising, therefore, that, you know, our own founding fathers as well, they have these notions that, privilege their race and their peoples, you know, against other uh, civilizations, despite the fact that they wrote the constitution in which allegedly it says all men are created equal. We all understand Thomas Jefferson's the infamous example who out of all of them was one of the better, one of the more enlightened minds. Thomas Jefferson, the same person who signed his name and was, was involved in penning the Declaration of Independence, all men are created equal, clearly didn't consider, you know, Africans to be of the same types of men that he is, or else he wouldn't write, all men are created equal. And he actually writes, as is well known, that the blacks are inferior to the whites in the endowments of both body and mind, end quote. And even Abraham Lincoln, you're all aware, uh, was, you know, obviously he was opposed to the institu institution of slavery, but to be clear, he did not believe in the equality of races. It is a verified fact, a well-known fact, that on multiple occasions, he even publicly said that he is not saying that whites and blacks are equally human. They're not equal. He actually believed that whites are superior to any other nation. And of course, the history of this country is well known to all of you. Uh, the prevailing attitudes um, of uh, uh, um, uh, the privileging of one uh, race over another, uh, it's still around to this day. It's only been uh, institutionally illegal, you know, up until uh, from 19, uh, 1965, the, uh, the, the acts that were passed. There are many people alive that witnessed and that were uh, um, uh, the, the subjects of insti not just institutionalized, but legalized racism. In other words, uh, mandated racial segregation uh, was around basically until one generation ago, as we're all aware. It's not been eons ago. It's not been millennia ago. It's literally been one generation. You know, the people that uh, our elders and, uh, you know, on a personal anecdote, my own father came to this land in the early 60s. And of course, you know, we're coming, you know, from a, a place not to, not Europe, and he's coming from India, Pakistan, and the brown skin color that he came with. I mean, you know, his stories as well of being uh, denied service, not being able to go to a barber shop, etc., not having a bank account, like all of these in the 60s sitting at the back of the bus, right? My own father, you know, is telling me these stories. That, so it's not like something that goes, you know, uh, generations and generations ago. We're all aware of the realities of race dynamics and how it's still endemic as a system. In fact, interestingly enough, uh, attempts to ban uh, globally, uh, at least in a legal way, racism have failed miserably. Uh, after World War I in the Treaty of Versailles, uh, when uh, a number of nations came together, perhaps the first time in human history, so many countries came together. Uh, some countries, in particular what we call what, what were called third world countries, they attempted to put in a racial equality clause in the Treaty of Versailles. They wanted to put in uh, uh, the notion that all countries and all peoples and all ethnicities should be considered equal and no distinction should be made because of race or ethnicity. And in fact, a majority of countries of the world uh, backed this uh, proposal. But surprise, surprise, England and America under Woodrow Wilson strongly objected and rallied support from nations like uh, Austria uh, and others. And because of the pressures put from these uh, superpowers of their time, uh, that clause was not added in the Treaty of Versailles. Dare I say, even if it had been uh, put in, it wouldn't have changed much on the reality, but it is a symbolic uh, victory. And of course, we're all aware of uh, the Nazi party and the rise of you know blatant race uh, politics and discrimination. What, uh, what, what many people are not aware of is that 
uh, Adolf Hitler uh, and uh, uh, the Nazi party in general uh, actually looked uh, at American institutionalized racism and adopted some of the key notions that were already prevalent in America and then of course exacerbated and built on them. Uh, and so Hitler wrote his mind, uh, Mein Kampf and in it he actually praises the United States for how it treated black people. And uh, he mentions the uh, the treatment of native Indians. So the notion that you know what we're doing in one land is not going to be uh, uh, um, uh, taken as examples in others. The notion that you know our injustices are localized is simply not true. Hitler explicitly took uh, much of what this country did uh, as institutionalized racism and then developed it when he uh, developed the uh, the protocols of the Nazi uh, party. And the point, of course, is that uh, we need to understand that racism uh, is as ancient, really, as recorded history. Now, all of this leads us to my next point, which is that uh, as Muslims, we are legitimately uh, very, very um, proud of our faith when our faith uh, comes with very clear notions, very explicit notions of uh, race equality. And uh, many uh, Muslim uh, philosophers and thinkers remark uh, that the explicit condemnations of racism uh, that are found in the Quran and that are found in the teachings of the Prophet, they are pretty much unprecedented in human history. Uh, the Quran itself is very clear that, O oh mankind, we have created you in different races and tribes so that you may get to know one another. The, the best of you uh, is the one that is the most pious amongst you. In other words, the, the concept of being best is not linked to one's race. This is explicit in the Quran. The best of you is the one that is the most pious, the most righteous. So in other words, your value, your worth, it comes from your character. It comes from you know your the, the content of your character, as MLK said, and not from the color of your skin. This is very explicit uh, in the Quran. And what is really interesting from the Islamic paradigm is that race equality isn't an afterthought in the in the tradition. Race equality does not come at the very end of the revelation of the Quran. It doesn't come, you know, as a secondary aspect of the teachings of, of the Prophet Muhammad. But rather, uh, from an Islamic perspective, uh, I think Muslims are legitimately, you know, they have a right to be to be proud here that and in a time and a culture and a place and an era and a civilization in which, uh, once again, race was considered to be very important. The Arabs considered themselves to be better than every other uh, race and they prided themselves on their heritage. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, who himself, of course, uh, was from the elite of the Arab tribes. In fact, uh, his tribe was the best tribe and the most uh, holiest of tribes. And and for him to then say all tribes are equal, and in fact, Arabs and non-Arabs are equal, and to explicitly say that there is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab or a white over a black, all of you are equally from Adam, the father of the prophet Adam. And Adam was created from clay or dust, right? So nobody should have any privilege over anybody else. And there are a number of interesting anecdotes that are mentioned in the uh, in the books of uh, 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 the lives and the biographies of the prophet Muhammad about how he stood by this principle, even in the face of harsh adversity. In the early uh, phase of the religion of Islam, uh, in the phase of Mecca, when uh, the when uh, the teachings of Islam were just being propagated and Muslims were being uh, you know tortured just like early Christianity the same notions of you know the believers are being tortured by uh, by uh, those outside of the faith people were literally killed literally decimated you know quartered just like in early Christianity in early Islam as well those who believed in the one God uh, were 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 pulled apart you know um, uh, uh, spears uh, you know uh, uh, thrusted into them uh, a number of people were, were were massacred and martyred in early Islam and in that time frame the most of the converts to the faith actually were people of non-arab uh, backgrounds you know and one of the most famous converts was a slave by the name of Bilal from Abyssinia, so a black slave. And uh, this slave, Bilal, he became famous across Mecca, uh, the city of Mecca, because of his conversion and because he was tortured and he refused to give up uh, the faith. Now, it is mentioned that uh, some, of the, uh, some of the elders and the nobility of the tribe were contemplating converting to monotheism. They were contemplating it, but they had a condition. And that condition was that they would not tolerate a faith in which people of a lower class would be treated the same as them. So they made an offer and they said that we're willing to convert 
if whenever we come to the gatherings, whenever we come to the mosque, whenever we come to your gatherings, you eliminate, you get rid of Bilal and everybody from a foreign background, everybody that's dark skin color, make sure they're not in the room so that it should not be said that we are sitting in the same place as our former slaves, okay? This was the condition they had, that uh, we're, we're willing to convert. We like the idea of monotheism. We don't want to worship, you know, idols that we carve our own hands. But, you know, this element of the faith, we don't want it. We don't want racial equality, right? And so some of the early converts, uh, they jumped with joy. They said, hey, we're going to get these, these, these powerful people on our side. We're going to get the rich nobility. So they tried to convince the prophet. They said, you know what? You know, I mean, I'm sure Bilal will understand that we're getting the VIP. We can just, we can just ask him to sit outside and he'll come back in later on. You know, we're going to get somebody really great to convert. But, you know, if it means he's going to uh, have his exclusive audience. He's not going to sit next to the 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 the, the, the quote unquote socioeconomically you know underprivileged. So what? They'll understand. As a response to this, and this is the really interesting point, the Quran, which is you know still recited to this day, these verses are still here. The Quran has revealed some very clear, very explicit verses in which God reprimands the very idea that you would do this, that God is explicitly stating in the Quran, these are verses that are still recited, you can find them in the Quran, do not expel from your gatherings those righteous individuals that are worshipping God day and night in order to appease, in order to look at the, the beauty of this world, meaning those people might appear to be beautiful, but the real beautiful people are the ones worshipping God, the pious people, right? Do not expel them, the Quran once again says, if you were to expel them, then you have destroyed yourselves. This is in the Quran. You're the wrongdoers. You're the unjust if you expel them. And so when this verse came down, uh, the Prophet stood up and he went to uh, where Bilal was sitting and he sat down with him and he said, my Lord has commanded me to sit with you and not with those guys that want to convert. So they ended up not converting. They ended up rejecting the faith because their condition was was not met. Now, what is really, um, you know, profound for us as Muslims is that this was at a time when uh, they would have argued, we need the conversion of these elite. We need these rich and powerful people on our side. But the principles of racial equality uh, could not be uh, hampered. They could not be bent uh, for uh, the whims of the elite class. And this shows us as Muslims that, uh, that uh, and I, I, as I said, legitimately, I have no problem saying this is something that definitely makes me very, uh, you know, very proud of my faith and proud in a, not in a, in a arrogant manner, but proud in a manner that it's, uh, I'm happy this is a faith that preaches racial equality that the very last speech that the prophet ever gave is consisting of five paragraphs famous speech you find it in uh, most muslim houses is in a you know in a painting or in a wall that they'll have a nice canvas with this speech summarized it's called the farewell speech of these five paragraphs one entire paragraph this is the last speech that he gave and is the speech that he gave to the largest audience in his life one paragraph is dedicated to racial equality and he said in that famously uh, you know recorded statement he said that there is no superiority of an arab over a non-arab of a white over a black all of you are equal all of you are from adam and adam came from dust so there should be no superiority of one person over another except with internal uh, piety and uh when the time came to choose the first caller to to prayer the first person who would be calling people to prayer uh he chose bilal and this was something that the people of the uh, the, uh, the land of mecca the the pagans the those who didn't accept the faith they found highly problematic to take uh bilal uh who was an african slave and then to appoint him to be somebody who's going to climb the highest place and call the pious to the mosque. And it's a very honorable position in the faith. Uh, for them, that was something that was very difficult to see, but that's not what our faith is based on. So, uh, and of course, uh, um, here I'm gonna introduce uh, a figure that uh, for, for, you know, for Americans uh, is contemporaneous uh, and, uh, you know, an interesting contrast to MLK, and, the, and that is Malcolm X, right? Malcolm X and MLK, uh, both similar time frame, both similar, you know, uh, goals, similar grievances, but 
very different methodologies on how to solve them. And I will mention here uh, that uh, something, this is something you should all be aware of that for the Muslim community, uh, obviously MLK is a hero, is a legend, uh, but Malcolm X is somebody that we claim as our own. So the, the impact that Malcolm has on us and the, the imagery that Malcolm, we respect MLK immensely, but I'll be honest with you, uh, the, the, for, for Muslim Americans, it's really uh, Malcolm is, is the one that we have a more of an attachment to simply because obviously, you know, he's using the language of our faith tradition. As you know, he converted to Islam and he was using our faith tradition. And in fact, he explicitly remarked um, before he passed away by a few months, you know, Malcolm uh, literally uh, said that America needs to understand the religion of Islam because it is the only religion that will help them battle racism. If they don't accept, uh, you know, the teachings of Islam, I can't see how else they're going to battle uh, racism. And he himself went through a number of phases. And the very last phase of his life, uh, a year before he passed away, he embraced, uh, um, you know, mainstream Islam when he went on the pilgrimage. And that's when he wrote uh, uh, these uh, these uh, words, or sorry, he spoke these words in an inter in an interview uh, where he praised. Uh, the notion of racial equality in Islam. So that's uh, one aspect, and that is the notion of racism. I have to do three aspects today about, uh, uh, regarding MLK's um, three evils. So let's now move on to uh, the next uh, evil that MLK uh, mentioned, and that is the evil of uh, capitalism, uh, the evil of uh, of uh, economic, um, uh, the economic disparity. And again, there's so many quotes from Martin Luther King uh, about the problems of the American economic system and the capitalist system. In 1966, he, he said that, um, I am saying there's something wrong with capitalism. There must be a better distribution of wealth and maybe America must move towards a democratic socialism, end quote. You know, this is Bernie Sanders right here, right? This is the same notion of you can't have this type of uh, wealth disparity. Uh, two weeks before his assassination, uh, in March of 1968, literally Really two weeks before his assassination, we can feel uh, Martin Luther King's uh, exasperation and frustration when he says in the famous uh, speech at, um, at, uh, at the Bishop Charles Temple of Church uh, in Memphis, he said this, you know, this is in the, the famous sanitation workers strike, you know, this is literally two weeks before his ass assassination, he says, if America does not use her vast resources of wealth to end pro poverty and to make it possible for all of God's children to have the basic necessities of life, she too will go to hell, end quote. He is condemning America to hell for um, uh, racial, for, sorry, for uh, economic uh, inequality. And that's why in a New York Times, famous New York Times interview, Martin Luther King uh, literally said that in a sense, our struggle is is a class struggle in a sense. Obviously, the racial is the primary, but what he means here is that race has also resulted in a division of a socioeconomic status and class that is well known to all of us. We're all aware that the average Caucasian household is triple or quadruple in terms of uh, net worth than the average African-American uh, household. So there's something that needs to be said here as well about uh, about uh, economic disparity and about uh, capitalism. And again, much can be said from an Islamic perspective. Uh, the, the notion of Islamic economics is a very, very interesting concept, much more than I can summarize in, in 10 minutes. We should all be aware though that uh, the faith of Islam, it is a faith that uh, does have suggestions and guidelines on every single uh, aspect of one's life. And much of it does deal with finances. In other words, the faith tells the faithful how to deal with their uh, finances. And there are laws and there are rules and there are regulations of a faith-based nature that are economic in manifestation. In other words, believing Muslims are very, very cautious about what they can or they cannot do. Uh, if if you log on to my YouTube channel and you go over, I have a special section called Q&A uh, where I'm asked questions by American Muslims. I would say 30% of those questions are economic in nature. That can I do this? Am I allowed to do this? Am I allowed to sell in this manner? Am I allowed to do all of these questions of an economic nature? They are very pertinent to uh, life. And they're asking, obviously, from an ethical perspective, from a moral perspective. Legally is one thing. And then ethically and morally and religiously is another. So Islamic economics is, is very, very uh, interesting. And it is 
different than uh, Western capitalism. It's not against it, but neither is it for it. It is its own uh, system. And some aspects conform with modern you know, capitalism and many aspects uh, do not. Obviously, this is not the time for a full-fledged lecture, but I think it will be interesting to go over maybe two or three uh, major differences or, and similarities. Now, obviously, Islamic economics, um, uh, it, the, the religion of Islam does afford private wealth and, and, and private property. It encourages entrepreneurship. And so in that sense, uh, the faith of Islam is definitely not communistic or completely socialistic in nature. Uh, the state does not own and control uh, everything. We don't just uh, divide up resources uh, uh, equally amongst every single person. There is private property. Uh, there is an encouragement to be uh, uh, resourceful and to have a job or to uh, to have a, a permissible source of income. And by the way, interestingly enough, uh, what is praised the most uh, in the traditions of the Prophet is actually manual labor. Uh, there's a famous tradition of the Prophet, the purest money that anybody can earn is the money that is earned from the sweat of your brow. So the effort that you put and then you're compensated for it, that is the purest uh, and the best type of income. And in fact, he himself, the prophet himself said that I used to be uh, a shepherd and I'm proud of that and that I used to have you know, a, a job when I was a younger person, that was the job that I had. And he mentioned that most of the prophets of God uh, were actually manual laborers, you know, so uh, carpentry or you know, um, uh, whatever other uh, uh, jobs that they had. And so he mentioned that uh, being somebody that has a trade or a profession is something that is a blessed. As for businesses and as for buying and selling, uh, the Prophet encouraged this as long as there's honesty. Uh, one of the things that is very severely forbidden is any type of dishonesty. He mentioned that uh, there are a number of traditions that mention that any uh, trader that is dishonest, that sells merchandise that is uh, subpar, promising it as something else, that that person will not be blessed by God. So all of the income would be considered to be uh, immoral. And that's one of the things that I get asked is that uh, interesting left, so Islamic economics. Again, there's so many interesting points here. Uh, if a... Um, uh, a, a, a righteous, God-fearing Muslim were to sell you something, by Islamic law, he is required to point out any major defects. He has to point that out. He cannot hide them. Or else uh, the money earned would be considered immoral, would be considered uh, not blessed by God. And so if he sells you a car, he should say, oh, you know, I'm having some brake problems. You should know about that. If he's selling you a house, you sh he, he should tell you, oh, you know, uh, inside the closet, maybe you didn't open it, but there's a crack, you know, over there. You should know about it. So this is actually Islamic law that you have to point out uh, uh, any major defect and not hide uh, or not try to deceive the buyer. He should be aware and you offer a price that is fair so that the person knows and is aware of that. So in that element, obviously, there's some similarities and some differences. One of the key differences is that Islam mandates charity. Uh, so there's two types of charity. There's obligatory charity called zakat. And then there's uh, encouraged charity called sadaqah. And so every practicing Muslim that earns above a, a basic threshold to live Every Muslim is required to give, well, required to give the first type, and the second is very, very, very strongly encouraged. And in practice, pretty much every Muslim will also be giving uh, extra charity. Charity is considered to be blessed, that every uh, uh, person should be constantly giving uh, charity as frequently as possible. And of course, the first type is obligatory. And therefore, in an ideal Islamic land, it would actually be collected by the state and then distributed to the poor by the state. And so uh, there is a public welfare system for food, for drinks, for housing, that every single person is going to be taxed a percentage. So the more you are, uh, you, you, you have the more that will come out in that um, charity. And then above and beyond, there will be uh, private charity uh, that will be given. And there's much in the Quran and in the traditions uh, about the blessed uh, are those who give their charity to the poor. I guess the fundamental difference between capitalism and between Islamic economics, and this is something very interesting, I think, is the prohibition of interest, of usury. And interest is considered to be... Uh, one of the major sins, and this is something that surprises people when they first hear about it, giving uh, interest, or, uh, sorry, charging interest, charging interest. So you give somebody a loan and you charge interest. You give somebody $10,000, say, hey, 3%, you know, 5%, whatever it might be. Believe it or not, you know, in Islam, we have a list of major sins, just like in Christianity, Catholicism, we have the list of major sins, right? 
believe it or not, like, you know, along with, you know, worshiping an idol and false image and murder and sleeping with your neighbor's wife, in that list, we have interest as well. And this like shocks people because the notion of interest being unethical or immoral is almost gone from the minds of modern men, even though for the bulk of European history, interest was viewed as a mortal sin. And in fact, it was banned for much of European uh, history. And again, go do your research and, and look, look that up. I don't have time to talk about that in this lecture. From the Islamic perspective, interest is a major sin that is on the same list as paganism and idolatry and, and, and murder, and on that list, somewhere on that same list, not to the same level as murder, but still on that list of major sins is to charge interest. Because for Muslims, interest is simply unethical. It is an obscene crime. It is a crime of the highest magnitude. And that is one of the main issues of, you know, uh, questions that I get and whatnot about, uh, is this permissible because they're charging even? So, of course, the highest crime is to charge interest. But you see, we have the same system for all people. So if you're not allowed to charge interest, you really shouldn't be paying somebody interest either, even though the sin isn't the same, but still you should not take an interest loan. So most uh, practicing Muslims in America, most religious and observant Muslims don't have loans for their houses. And uh, many of them don't even have credit cards because, uh, because obviously credit cards by their nature charge interest. I even know of some Muslims that don't want to have a bank account, you know, because uh, of the whole uh, enterprise of interest. And there's all of these different mechanisms that uh, that they use here. Now, of course, uh, the notion of interest being unethical, as I said, is something that just surprises people. And yet, should it? Really? Should it? Th think about it. What is interest? Interest is the rich profiting off of the fact that they're rich, not just profiting, guaranteeing a profit from the backs of those that do not have the same wealth simply because they have it they're guaranteed to get more of it. And you see what interest does in a society is that it makes the rich richer and the poor and the middle class are not typically gonna get to that level, generally speaking. And that's exactly what we see in the last 100 years. There's a beautiful chart in the New York Times of the top 1% and the top 0.1%, how in the last 100 years, you know, the amount of wealth that is accrued by the top 1% and top 0.1% has increased exponentially. The middle class is slowly forced downwards to uh, lower middle. And the, and of course, you know, uh, 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 poverty is on the rise. And there are so many examples in our own lifetimes. You know, I mean, um, uh, the 2008, uh, you know, uh, uh, crash. I think that's a classic example is illustrative of the dangers of interest. You know, banks wanting to make a profit, you know, continue to give loans to people generally speaking, innocent, you know, underqualified people, basically, you know, poor and broke people who don't, don't know the, how the system works. They're intentionally being deceptive. They're intentionally enticing innocent, inexperienced people to take loans they can't afford. They know they're doing this, right? And it's only going to be a matter of time before a grand Ponzi scheme of that nature is going to collapse. And yet, when it does collapse, as it did in 2008, who gets bailed out? Is it the end user who purchased the dream house that he couldn't afford? Or is it the billionaire bankers who flew into DC on their private jets? You know, again, the whole system is set up in a very, very unethical manner. And that's exactly what there's a famous verse in the Quran. Uh, it's a Quranic verse. It's literally in the Quran that the Islamic economic system aims so that the rich don't just transfer money amongst themselves. This is literally a verse in the Quran that Money should not be a plaything just transferred amongst the rich. We want money to be uh, to be distributed in a more equitable manner. And I think one of the most jaw-dropping realities of the economic disparities that we're seeing uh, in our countries and lands is this COVID crisis and the fact that, you know, according to a recent article in The Guardian, one of the most prestigious newspapers in England, uh, The Guardian uh, estimated in an in a exhaustive um, uh, journal or journal article that they have in an exhaustive article that they have, they estimated that uh, the wealth of billionaires during the last year of the COVID crisis has increased by, get this, $10 trillion. $10 trillion. Now, I don't know about you guys. I'm speaking on behalf of myself and I think 99% of this country. This last year, 
Definitely, I'm not going to complain and say that I, I know I have a roof over my head and I have food to eat, but economically, my income and you know, it's not been the same, it has affected. You know, it's been, it's, I'm not going to say difficult, I thank God, but it's not been the way it was two, three, four, five years ago. This year has not been easy, you know, for most of us, it has not been easy. In this time frame, when 95% of the country is, you know, pinching to some level, some more than others, right? To, to hear that billionaires increase their wealth by $10 trillion. I mean, at what point are we going to be brave enough to start questioning the morality of people hoarding billions of dollars when within the same zip code there are people starving? Within their own vicinities, walking distance, I guarantee you, walking distance, I guarantee you, there will be people that cannot afford life-saving medicine. To At what point are we going to say this is simply unethical and immoral? I mean, you know, there comes a point in one's wealth where an extra few billion will not even change your lifestyle. You can't even buy something extra that you couldn't buy. At what point are we going to say that is simply unethical and immoral? You cannot. So anyways, my point being that, you know, uh, MLK's anger is palpable. Uh, his condemnation of this country to hell, we kind of understand it. And I think, I mean, again, what would Jesus do? We, we Muslims believe in Jesus. What would Jesus do if he saw this wealth inequality? I mean, if he uh, got irritated at the money lenders you know, of his time. And he, uh, um, according to the New Testament, uh, was it, uh, don't don't quote me, I haven't read the scripture for a long time. Did he kick or did he push? I forgot. But I know that he physically assaulted the tables of the money exchangers, right? And, you know, again, why? Because they're charging interest, right? Again, so imagine the, the, the palpable anger that, you know, Jesus Christ himself had for that group of people. What do you think, you know, the prophets of God would say to this type of wealth inequality? And I think as Muslims, we can definitely, definitely not just sympathize but actually offer some you know concrete uh suggestions about uh what needs to be done uh time is almost up and actually there's a very long section left of militarism i'll quickly go over this and then i know we have some uh, q a as well uh the, the the final evil that mlk mentions which is in some ways the most difficult and awkward for many segments of our society and that is because this evil has been colored by a false notion of patriotism by uh this 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 um illusion that to merely talk about it is somehow unpatriotic and is somehow uh, uh, attempting to justify any type of terrorist attack, it's very difficult to, to even talk about this notion. Nonetheless, especially because we're talking about Martin Luther King, uh, Martin Luther King once again gave a famous speech about Vietnam in which he mentions, um, and I'm not going to quote all of it, but he mentions that the Vietnam War is one of the most unjust wars that the history of mankind has ever seen. Footnote here, imagine if you had seen the invasion of Iraq, of Afghanistan. Imagine if you had seen Guantanamo. Imagine if you had seen what we're doing across the world right now. Uh, he mentions that the Vietnam War has done nothing other than strengthen the military industry complex. This is Martin Luther King saying, speaking like this. Uh, he mentions that it is uh, creating a very bad image for, of America and the rest of the world. He mentions that it's wreaking havoc on our domestic uh, policies and destinies. We're spending thousands of dollars, he calculated the exact amount, to kill every Viet Cong soldier, and yet there are people in the inner cities that cannot even have food or, and are on food stamps and poverty and whatnot. And he has a whole list of evils. And the sad reality, the sad reality is that every single one of those points, it not only resonates with us today. It's been exacerbated. It's actually gone worse than what he said 50 years ago. Again, much can be said. I'm going to summarize my uh, militarism you know, uh, uh, um, aspect in five points. Point number one, that much of our form, and I'm going to just make these statements. I, I don't have time to back them up, but I will make them. And if in the Q&A, we want to back them up or examples can be said. Uh, the first point, it needs to be said unequivocally. Much of our foreign policy much of our, our warfare is actually not in our best interests. It's not for our survival. It's not for our safety. In fact, it can be argued that it jeopardizes our or interests. And it causes so much hatred in the rest of the world that it is not for our safety. It's actually against our safety. It fuels our own policies fuels much of the anger that then is used to sometimes justify attacks against us. This needs to be said. Secondly, 
echoing Martin Luther King, in fact, echoing President Eisenhower even before Martin Luther King by a decade. President Eisenhower's last speech uh, from the White House, right? Today, one president left the White House. The day Eisenhower left the White House, he gave a speech. It's online. You can find it, black and white uh, re recording. President Eisenhower mentions the unhealthy alliance between the military complex and between our government, between the private sectors that are producing bombs and weapons and planes, let me add here, oil, and between our foreign policy. This has been pointed out 70 years, not just MLK, Lots of people are pointing this out. There is a very, very unhealthy and unholy alliance between multi-billion dollar corporations that manufacture weapons, manufacture war provisions, other sectors like the oil companies and between our own government. Look at Dick Cheney, where he was before and what he did after leaving uh, the White House. Therefore, it is simply naive and untenable to assume that our foreign policies, our warmongering, our invasions are completely independent of the interests of our multi-billion dollar corporations. Therefore, this leads me to my third point. There is no independent accountability. There is no assessment of the validity of our policies by third parties that we can assume to be neutral. In fact, all we need to do is to look at the Iraq invasion post 9-11 that we now know was an intentional deception. It was a lie that was perpetrated and propagated by people who knew they were lying to the American public. And millions of people lost their lives. Trillions of dollars were spent. And yet... Not a single person was so much as reprimanded, much less fired, God forbid, actually sent to jail for the intentional deception of the entire American population. Who is going to respond? Who is going to pay for the crimes of invading the land and killing at least two million Iraqis, at least a million and a half of uh, Afghanis? Who's going to pay the price of destroying and decimating innocent civilians across the globe? There is no accountability for the crimes of uh, uh, what are we ourselves are doing. And therefore, Again, this is not a justification, but again, if you read what the other side is saying, you understand the anger and you understand what they are doing. This leads us to our fourth point, is that, uh, again, what Martin Luther said, as we spend trillions on our wars, he said millions, now it is trillions, right? Uh, the, um, the Times magazine calculated that we spent, we have spent over six trillion dollars in the last 15 years on the war on terror six trillion dollars right so you know what is going to happen then to our domestic issues what's going to happen to our own hospitals to our own citizens what's going to happen when we keep on spending uh we spend as one nation on our military more than the next 20 nations combined the amount of money we spend on killing other people is obscene even as our own citizens are dying even as they're told not to worry about their own health care here we are you know uh you know spending trillions overseas so no better example of this is our current pandemic it is truly and again i I have, you know, I've lived in many countries and I have friends across the globe here. Here we are, supposedly the greatest superpower in the world. And yet across the globe, people are getting vaccinated and people are getting, you know, better treatment for uh, COVID than right now. I don't even know when my turn is going to come. And my elderly parents, I, I, I applied for them. They're above the age of both of them are in their 80s. I applied for them and not even uh, not even a date and I'm in Texas, not even a date of when the vaccines are going to come. And even as I speak, friends across the globe have been vaccinated, they, or at least they know where they're going to be vaccinated. And here we are, because again, our system is in complete chaos and our healthcare, as we're aware. And so again, we can say so much and time is limited. My final point of this, and then I'll conclude uh, the fifth point which is I think one of the key points that um, uh, uh, why I'm even speaking to all of you and I, because of time, I'm going to have to summarize this. So here we are spending trillions, killing millions, right, for our warfare. How do we possibly sell this narrative to our peoples? How can we tell them that we shouldn't be worried about their own health and we should be worried about spending billions on our defense? How do we possibly sell them this narrative? There's only one way to do that. And that way is, well, it's composed of multiple parts. We have to create a bogeyman. We have to create an enemy and exacerbate and exaggerate the evil of that enemy, the nefariousness of that enemy, and then 
make our own citizens absolutely terrified, petrified of that false enemy. We create a Frankenstein in the minds of our people, not even a real Frankenstein. And then we sell to them that we shall protect them against that Frankenstein. And this is where American Muslims in particular have been trying to point out for the last 20 years, the narrative that the rest of America is being sold. They're being told that the enemy that's attacking them has no valid reasons to attack, that it is as if we are all angelic and they are all demonic. And they are demonic because there's something different about them. And that difference is the faith. It is the religion of Islam. Islam is the enemy, as Donald Trump says. And those people cannot be rationalized or understood. Their faith, their beliefs, their book, their prophet become the sources of evil and not, God forbid, anything we might be doing to them. No, no, no. It's their problem, their mentality, their book. Anybody dares bring up anything we might be doing and immediately we accuse them of being unpatriotic. We accuse them of sympathizing with the terrorists. The mere attempt to rationally discuss becomes banned. And so the threat of the other becomes far more exaggerated to the point of overshadowing any other threat. And of course, we have seen this. Yes, 9-11 was horrific. But after 9-11, jihadist terrorism is almost, almost, you know, uh, non-existent compared to any other type of domestic uh, threat. And therefore, what happens is every other internal threat, domestic threat is trivialized. And again, no better example of this than the far right and the threat that the far right presents. You know, 9-11 was tragic, no question about it, but 9-11 was not an existential threat to this country. And 9-11, we all banded together and we said, those are the bad guys that shouldn't have done that. Look at the uh, invasion of the Capitol last week. It's dividing America. If anything, this is far more serious than 9-11 because this is a potential civil war that is taking place, as we all see. And yet, the threat is still on those radicals, the brown skin bearded, Allahu Akbar, quote unquote, jihadists. And again, much can be said here, but in reality, their uh, anger and their uh, you know, um, reasons are not religious. They are political. I'm not justifying. I have to say this all the time. I'm not justifying. I'm contextualizing. Read what they're writing. Listen to what they're saying. Their anger has nothing to do with the book of God that they believe in. Their anger has everything to do with politics and policies. And unless and until we discuss, you know, the policies of why they're so irritated and angry, nothing is going to be uh, done. In any case, much can be said here, but Martin Luther pointed this out again, you know, 50 years ago. So to conclude, to conclude the three evils that Martin Luther King uh, pointed out, uh, the evils of militarism and the evils of capitalism and the evils of racism, he said very presciently that the three are linked together and we're not going to solve one without all others. And we admire Martin Luther King immensely. And we as Muslims say that Malcolm X uh, also understood these problems and Malcolm X his solution was that there has to be uh, more than just talk from his perspective, his solutions also included a theological component. And that's why for us, at least, you know, indeed, Martin Luther King uh, was indeed uh, the civil rights leader. Uh, but as I said, Malcolm X has a status and a love that we cannot deny. And that's because he spoke to us in a language that, you know, we we, we, we um, uh, can, can appreciate. Final point, nobody can, should understand that, you know, uh, there's any type of negativity towards either of these two. The way I see this in an all honesty, we needed a Martin Luther King but we also needed a Malcolm X. And I think the two of them put together, they help us understand and see the pros and cons of both of their tactics. They both agreed, you know, they were, they were frenemies, right? They weren't close, neither were they enemies. They understood that, you know, the, the other has tactics that they disagree with, but they understood that the other is not on the other side. They understood that the two of them are fighting for the same causes and they're fighting for the same peoples and they're fighting for the same justice and the same equal rights, but they strongly disagreed with each other's policies. I'm going to say, quite frankly, I think both of them were right. I think there's an element of MLK and there's an element of Malcolm that should be in all of us. And uh, with that, I finish my particular talk. I hope that uh, there was some benefit and, and thought provocation. And with that, I hand it back to the uh, moderator. Thank you all for listening. Jazakallah khair, uh, Imam um, Yasser. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, 
Um, okay, community, uh, we want to take 10 minutes, 10-minute uh, break, get up, stretch, get a glass of water, do whatever you need. I know I need one. <laughs> it's been a fantastic lecture, so we appreciate you being here. Um, and um, uh, we will resume at, at uh, 1.05. So uh, we'll take that 10 minute break, we'll resume at 1.05 uh, for the uh, Q&A session with uh, Dr. Yesser. Please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, submit any questions that you have. And uh, we also would like you to fill out the form. Please let us know. Uh, we're here for you students in the community. So please let us know, um, uh, uh, fill out the, uh, the link and the evaluation, give us uh, some feedback, okay? And uh, we appreciate you if you have to get to class and uh, this is all you can attend. That's okay as well. It was great having you. Thank you for being here and joining us. Okay. We'll see you all at 105. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome back Highline family. Uh, we now will resume the Q and A portion of this programming. Uh, we have some great questions. Feel free to submit more questions in the Q and A feature at the bottom of your screen um, as we move along. Hey, okay, so the first question is, where can I get your lecture if I want to read? Um, so I actually have um, a large social media presence. Uh, most of my stuff is on there. I have um, hundreds of lectures on YouTube, quite a few of them dedicated to uh, this topic of, um, uh, there's one as well that I gave when ISIS was particularly in the news. I gave it uh, in a public auditorium in Memphis when I was there. It's called uh, American Foreign Policy and the Rise of ISIS. And so that's um, uh, and it's on YouTube. So if you just Google my name, uh, Yasser Khaldi, Y-S-R-Q-A-D-H-I, you'll find my Facebook and Twitter and social media and, and um, YouTube. And uh, I that's where I usually have my stuff. I do not have a book or an article published about uh, this particular topic. Uh, my, my PhD is in classical Islamic theology, abstract issues you would you probably would not be interested in reading about you know 12th century um you know uh intra muslim issues of theology that's where my expertise is so uh my talks of this nature are going to be found on youtube and if you want to subscribe to my uh every once in a while so i i am uh i am a professor and a cleric um and so i have both of these um um my feet are in both the doors if you like uh and I, m most of my posts are of a religious nature, but quite a lot are also political. And so if you subscribe to my Twitter or Facebook, maybe every fourth or fifth or sixth post is going to be, uh, you know, a commentary on what's going on from a political perspective. So if you're interested, you'll, you'll find much over there. Thank you. Thank you, Shay. Um, our uh, next question um, is, uh, uh, how realistic is it to encounter a Muslim terrorist in America now? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely and totally unrealistic. Um, FYI, when ISIS um, reached its peak, maybe 2004 or so, uh, I gave a very, very passionate sermon against it. It went viral. And because of that, ISIS... Um, put yours truly on their magazine and call for my assassination. And uh, they did it again the next year. I have the dubious distinction of being, as far as I know, the only person to um, be threatened twice by ISIS, by name and by picture. And calls went out to assassinate me. Uh, the FBI visited my house to give me protection techniques. Um, they came to my office. I mean, it was a, it was a, um, uh, interesting time. Uh, but I was not worried at all. I didn't really take any precautions. The reason being that I'm not worried about radical Islam in America. I'm really not. As a Muslim cleric who travels across the country, I've spoken at more than 500 mosques. Uh, I am a mainstream speaker at the largest conferences at peak time. You know, they put me at main stage, you know, 15,000, 20,000 people and um, I don't have any security guards. I don't have, because I'm not worried, really not worried. Like I know my community so well, I am not worried at all about some radical Muslim terrorists. I mean, they don't, they really don't exist as an organized group. I mean, a deranged individual, you cannot, you cannot prevent against, right? But as an organized group, they simply do not exist. They do exist in Syria. Had I been in Syria, 
I would have taken precautions, okay? Had I been in other lands, but here in America, uh, it's a bogeyman threat. They have not been organized. I, I repeat, organized. Lone individuals, you can't. I mean, you know, people go and shoot up uh, movie theaters and school shootings more commonly than Muslims go and do whatever they do. Statistically speaking, you will you are more likely to be killed in a in a school or in a theater by some crazed you know far right person you know than you are by uh, a Muslim terrorist. So I'm not at all worried um, at uh, at uh, radical Islamic terrorism. And I speak as somebody who, as I said, my life is around the Muslim community. My my speeches, my lectures are around the Muslim community, and I've never once felt any type of fear, even when. ISIS literally called for my assassination. It's public news. The New York Times mentioned this. Um, you know, I was interviewed by Fox News. The only one time in my life that Fox News wanted to interview me, I grudgingly accepted. CNN, it's all you can you can check this online. They interviewed me after that uh, to talk about my feelings. And um, it, there's no, I'm not worried at all. I'm still not worried. Uh, I'm more worried, frankly, about the far right than I am about about radical Muslims. Okay. Thank you, Sheikh. Um, our next question is: um, Where you you've talked about the uh, the three evils and how they uh, they are related to each other? If you can elaborate a little bit more about that, a good question. Um, so the three evils they are related to one another because, generally speaking, they affect the same demographics, right? They're going to affect the same demographics. So uh, the people who benefit the most you know, from uh, the racist policies, they're obviously, you know, the, the larger demographics of this country. Uh, the ones who benefit the most from uh, capitalism are the wealthy and elite. The ones who benefit the most from our, you know, militarism are once again, the exact same demographics. So I'm, I apologize to be stereotypical, but look at the far right, okay? The, look at how they're interconnected together. Look at who benefits from those types of policies, okay? And the sad thing is lots of members of the far right are themselves economically disprivileged, but they're being sold, as I said in my last point, they're being sold a narrative that this is patriotism. They're not even benefiting economically per se, as much as the people that are selling the lies to them actually benefit economically. But they're, And this isn't some conspiracy theory. I mean, all you need to do is to look at healthcare, right? Uh, and this is something that Bernie Sanders mentions, Noam Chomsky mentions, a lot of intellectual thinkers mention, uh, the antagonism that uh, certain members of the public feel towards free healthcare. Where is this coming from? Why? It's because it's not going to be beneficial to a certain group and a certain demographics, the same groups that are benefiting from the militarism of America, the same groups that are benefiting from the economic exploitation. And generally speaking, in terms of their race, they belong to one particular class, if you get my drift. So it's it's simple interests. It's, it's a group of people that have the power. It's not a, I don't believe in bizarre conspiracy theories. I don't believe there's a cabal sitting in some basement somewhere, but I do believe in the influence of money. I do believe that politics can be tainted by people that are getting paid by corporations that have you know, the funds to give them. And if you look at how uh, politics has changed in the last decade, especially uh, you know the Supreme Court decision that allows you know um, donor money to come in, uh, you know third party packs to be created, anonymous packs to be created. We don't even know where the money is coming from. You know, in the end of the day, the politician has to answer to those that that are financing him more than he has to answer to those that elected him. And that is the reality. What are you going to do when you convince? And that's, again, I, I encourage all of you to read Chomsky's the, uh, Manufacturing Consent. Chomsky is one of his first books that he wrote uh, when it comes to political thought. Manufacturing Consent, the illusion of consent. You are creating a narrative that you sell to large segments of the country that, you know, healthcare is socialist, healthcare is communist, for example, right? The people that are being sold that actually suffer they themselves are not economically privileged. They're suffering, but they're being told they're linking it to uh, patriotism and they're linking it to our core American values. So I think all you need to look at is to look at the, the, the group that is benefiting from these policies and you find that they're basically you know, one essential segment. 
And uh, that segment benefits when America goes to war. It benefits when uh, certain classes are privileged over others. And to sell that narrative, they have to throw in the card of racism. They have to throw in the card of, you know, uh, American, you know, uh, identities and values. And again, all of this is key terms that are meant to disguise far more uh, uh, vicious realities. These days, you cannot say, you know, white versus black. Rather, you say American values, as if they get to decide American values and American realities. See, I was born and raised here. Why can't I as well be a part of that narrative? Why can't my identity also come into play? My values, my faith, you know, what privileges somebody else as being more authentically American than, than I am? But again, that is the narrative that is being created. So they are linked together simply because uh, the people that benefit the most, generally speaking, uh, these three are causally linked to the narrative that, 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 that is being created. I hope that, that answers your question. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Sheikh. Our next question, uh, Betty is going to read it for us. Thank you, Betty. So our next question reads, you implied that America should have a more democratic government using Martin Luther King as a source. Um, you also confirmed that uh, in order for this to work, um, you talked about Muslims' morality and laws. However, in America, although many are religious, the morality standard is declining. How can America have a democratic government when the morality standards are not as high as they were before? There's no easy answer. I'm not going to lie to you. There's no easy answer. This is the problem that all uh, religious figures are facing right now. You know, Martin Luther, I mean, myself at some level, I mean, all of us, like, it's it's frustrating because we feel, I feel very passionately that you have to have some faith. You have to have some religion. I'm not saying if you don't, then you're, you're, you're going to, but I'm saying faith helps you. Let me put it this way. Having a higher power and source and having uh, a morality that stems from a, a you know, a, a godly tradition, I feel this better for us. Obviously, I know people are going to disagree, but I feel, and I know Martin Luther King felt this way and Malcolm X felt this way, that it helps. And I think, you know, um, this is where we're just going to have to try our best. And those that are uh, in agreement, you know, we'll go with that. Those that aren't, uh, at least we can agree to have a civilly uh, robust, a civic society. Have, we can agree to uh, better the circumstances of all peoples, regardless of faith. So I am a faith preacher. I believe in my faith. Uh, Martin Luther King was a faith preacher. Malcolm X was a faith preacher. You have to cut us some slack when we say we want people to have faith. What else do you expect from us, right? Of course, we're going to say that. Even as we say that, we know that not everybody is going to have faith. And we know that, you know, some people are, are going to have different understandings of morality. We have to accept that and, and we have to live with that. And now, as long as we can agree on our vision of a better world. And I think that we can all agree that racism is evil. We can all agree that we have to work towards, you know, economic uh, uh, stability towards all peoples. Everybody should have food to eat. Everybody should have a roof over their head at some level. So as long as we can agree to those policies, after that, any type of disagreement should be within ourselves and healthy. In other words, let's agree to disagree as long as we agree on the objectives and goals. So I am not advocating uh, a religious theocracy, not at all, not at all. I'm not advocating that, you know, everybody, you know, um, become, uh, you know, wanting to, to, to implement their laws religiously. But I am advocating as a religious person that people should think about the role of religion in their lives. They should think about structuring their morality around a higher faith. And again, I mean, as a Muslim, I think a lot of people don't understand this. As a Muslim, we respect and love Jesus. And we value the teachings of Jesus. And we feel, and I'm not trying to offend anybody, but I just, that's the way we feel, that many people who claim to love Jesus don't implement the values of Jesus in their lives. We would much rather, and we don't agree with Christian theology because we believe that, again, long point here, but we believe that Christian theology doesn't represent the teachings of Jesus. That's a theological point. But we do agree with Christian ethics. Right? Do you understand the difference? We don't agree with the Trinity. We don't agree with the redemption, but we do agree with Christian ethics. And it kind of hurts us, surprises us that those who follow this figure don't seem to follow the figure, if you get my point here. Right. So I don't I, I don't have an easy answer. 
I think we're just going to have to uh, understand that we have different languages and discourses, and we're going to have to allow the people of faith to speak the language of faith, even as we understand that not everybody's going to like it, and not everybody's going to you know live up to it. But it is what it is. I, I don't have a stronger answer for you than, than, than what it is. Thank you. Um, our next question reads, how do you see this new administration tackling MLK's three evils? Oh boy, you asked me a question that's probably gonna um, be disappointing for you. So I began this talk by cryptically saying, let us welcome the return of our standard evils. Okay, that's basically how I began this talk. We are accustomed to the standard problems. You know, Donald Trump was an aberration, took us to a different plane. I am no idealist. I don't believe in a messiah figure in politics. I don't. Biden's not going to magically transform the country. I just hope he makes it better than it is, that's all. But it is almost impossible, given our current circumstances, to reorient our military uh, understanding of our nation. We are the largest, as, as Noam Chomsky has said, this Chom I'm, I'm a big fan of Chomsky, by the way. As Noam Chomsky says, we are the largest empire in human history. The largest. And to be that empire, that global empire, with over 150 military bases across the globe, right? We have invaded more lands and killed more peoples and whatnot and than any other civilization in the history of mankind. That's not going to change overnight. I'm hopeful that given the pandemic and given you know, a number of tragedies of the last few decades, more and more people will see. But I'm not thinking that a radical 180 is going to take place. I, I'm not thinking that's going to happen. I'm more uh, pragmatic than that. You know, I'm just hoping that we can modify and change. And I'm also believing that, you know, our job, so here I'm speaking as a person of faith, our job isn't necessarily to see the transformation in our lifetimes. Our job is to come closer to it so that we can say to God, we've done our job, okay? So my job is to just push the world forward in my own sphere of influence. My job is to raise public awareness. My job is to demonstrate to the American, you know, my colleagues, my friends, my neighbors, my the people that listen to me, the harms of much of what we're doing, okay? So if more and more people see, and I would, for, we didn't talk about a lot of other, you know, major problems. I mean, there were the foreign policies. I mean, uh, we didn't even begin to mention Palestine and Israel. And the discourse has changed dramatically in the last 15 years. More and more people are now seeing the two sides. When I was growing up in the 80s, right? I was born in the 70s, grew up in the 80s. When I was growing up in the 80s, there was only one side. Now, more and more people are understanding, hey, hold on a sec. We're not even listening to the other side. Let's listen to what they have to say. So that took decades of work and of patience and of bringing up the narrative slowly but surely. And it is finally changing more and more, especially younger American uh, uh, people of the Jewish faith are seeing that their own country has policies that are clearly apartheid, clearly apartheid, discriminating against human beings based upon their origin and based upon, you know, their faith traditions. And a simple example here, you know, uh, the COVID vaccine is available in Israel, but only one race is getting it. The Palestinians are not getting it. Think about that. Just think about that, right? The Palestinians are not getting vaccinated. So my point, well, we went into a tangent here. My point is, how did this discourse even become public? Finally, after two, three, four, five decades, people are now beginning to see. Those that began the discussion 30, 40 years ago, maybe they've passed on, maybe they don't even see it. My job is not necessarily to see the end, but it is to push it, push the narrative forward. So I don't think that Biden's administration is radically going to transform. But the very fact that he's going to cancel the Muslim ban, Right, the very fact that um, he's talking more proactively about many of the problems, the vaccine, the COVID, you know, situation, whatnot. You know, I hope Guantanamo shuts down. You know, remember symbolically, uh, Barack Obama's very first signature, the very first signature, 2008. I remember we were so hopeful, right, was to shut down Guantanamo. You know that that icon of American imperialism and injustice, you know, to this day, everybody in prison there was a Muslim. Almost every, almost everybody was in a 
innocent. We all know this, but because of you know wars and whatnot, they're just in limbo, complete limbo. Still, there are people chained up and being treated worse than dogs for the last 20 years on some island, you know, off the coast of Cuba, and they have no hope. Still there. I would hope that again, pressure is applied, things begin to change. But if it doesn't happen, you know, maybe we're not going to win every single battle. But the goal is not to, to necessarily see that change. The goal is to push it forward. Martin Luther King didn't see much of what, what is happening now, you know. But still, I believe overall his message was a success because it created that change, you know. So I hope that answers your question. I'm a pragmatist. I'm not an idealist. Absolutely. Thank you, Sheikh. We're going to move to our next question. And uh, this is from one of our colleagues. And uh, uh, at Highline, we have a, a large uh, Muslim community um, uh, as well. And we wanted to, my, our, one of our colleagues is asking, uh, what are things that you should or you should not do in the presence of a Muslim? I know that's a loaded question, but just uh, some, uh, some feedback. <laughs> um, I don't really see any major uh, uh, problems or issues where you shouldn't do. The main issue obviously is uh, respect a person's faith. All of us should do this of each other's faiths. And um, I guess when it comes to the college um, campus atmosphere, I guess you're asking for very specific minutia. Um, generally speaking, um, understand if you're a professor or a teacher that you know um, Muslims might have to if you have an exam on a Friday, for example, they might have Friday afternoon prayers. Um, other things that come that are important is that uh, touching the opposite gender is sometimes frowned upon, okay? And so, especially if a, a lady is wearing the hijab or whatnot, that maybe a handshake would not be, uh, you know, appropriate, that they might think that that's, you know, so again, Muslims are a little bit more, you know, conservative uh, in that regard. Other than that, I don't, there are no, there are no, I mean, I would say if you, if you see, um, uh, somebody of a different background and you're having a conversation, ask them. Muslims love to talk about their faith. You know this as well as I do. Muslims love to talk about their views on politics. And generally speaking, you will be pleasantly surprised at how knowledgeable Muslims are of current situations and affairs and across the globe, because actually all minorities, generally speaking, are far more cognizant of the realities of the world than the dominant majority. I, I hope you see what I'm saying almost all minorities by virtue of the fact that they're minorities by virtue of the fact that they're um uh you know occupying multiple spaces if you like they're far more aware of the realities of the world that we live in uh than many other segments so you will be pleasantly surprised if you simply open up a conversation and ask him or her about uh beliefs and about uh, modern issues and even you know ask them directly like you know what um you know, what, uh, is there anything I hear, uh, anything that makes you awkward or whatnot? But generally speaking, nothing, nothing much. I mean, um, I can't really think of anything that would be problematic per se. And even if you were to, let's say, put a hand out or whatnot, you know, the other person is going to explain or clarify and, and life goes on. So you don't have to handle Muslims with any extra care or protection or precaution or, you know, wear gentle white dainty gloves as you do with them. No, they're regular human beings. Crack a joke at them, laugh with them, you know, just be as you are. And hopefully you'll be pleasantly surprised that we're just as human as everybody else. Thank you, Sheikh. I think we have we have the time for one more question, um, and the last one is uh, uh, specifically to you. Um, uh, it uh, says, "Have you considered doing a tour for speeches? I really like your speech." So. <laughs> um, I'm very busy in the life that I live. I'm generally speak. So I have, as I said, I have two uh, two areas that I'm active with. I used to be a college professor at Rhodes College, but um, it became too taxing. I, 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 most of my life is dedicated to my clerical work with my community. And so I actually had to resign from Rhodes College. Uh, and I'm no longer an actual, you know, professor. I used to be teaching in college and whatnot. Now it's all, I'm, uh, I'm teaching at a seminary, Islamic seminary, and I'm um, doing other things. I'm, I, I, I'm not turning that down, but it's just very difficult to schedule me. And, um, because of COVID, I'm sitting at home. I mean, when uh, your college reached out and said, you know what, I'm just sitting here, you know, I'm in this is my library, this is my house, my ca I can give you guys a lecture, no problem. But to be brutally honest, if you had invited me to a physical journey and coming down, most likely it would not have been possible because that takes up too much time. And I, I have so much going on. So uh, those of you listening, if you're interested, just Google my name and 
you know, um, subscribe to my YouTube and my Facebook and Twitter is where I'm most active. You know, I have a uh, half a million on Twitter and around a million on Facebook. So I have a lot of people I'm interacting with. Uh, so you'll hear much more from me directly and you'll see why I'm so busy in other projects that doing these types of tours is not out of the question, but it's just um, not that feasible to do given how much I have on my plate. But I had a great time, um, you know, talking with all of you and I hope that you guys, uh, you guys benefited. Absolutely, it's been uh, it's been great uh, um, having you. It's been like I said, it's been uh, uh, great to get a, a perspective. We've been uh, we're, we're, our college. We we try to do everything we can to to bring awareness around current topics and 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 hear from uh, uh, from different speakers. And it's been uh, uh, so. I want to thank you for being here and and thank uh, the organization that we worked with. They've been fantastic about uh, uh, about uh, um, getting. Appreciate it. So, uh, we appreciate you. Um, so. Um, Yes, so that concludes our program. Thank you so much. Um, uh, the, thank you for being here with us. And uh, we look forward to, uh, to our students uh, and our faculty and staff possibly being uh, big fans and following you on, on social media. So we appreciate it. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Take care then. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Okay, this concludes our uh, program for today. Um, and then, uh, so please, uh, we need your feedback. So please fill out the survey. Um, and then uh, I'll pass it on to uh, Betty for the information on tomorrow. Sorry, everyone, my mute button there. Um, we would like to invite you tomorrow uh, to our program titled Racial Equity, Moving from Commitment to Action. It is with our presenters, Epiphany and Jesse Johnson. It will be tomorrow, Thursday, January 21st from 12 to 1.30 p.m. And you can find that information in the chat box. Again, if you did visit us today, we ask that you fill out the evaluation as it helps us um, when planning for future events. Thank you.